Hi guys, I'm JM, this is the Lotus Diaries, and today is an exceedingly good day because today I'm driving for the first time ever a Lotus Esprit. So the purpose of today's video is to answer a fairly simple question. The Avora 400 takes over from the Esprit V8 as the most powerful production Lotus ever made. The Avora S was about 5 horsepower shy of the title. And given the fact that any new Esprit is some way off, I'm asking the question, if you always hang it after an Esprit, but either your perfect one is now out of reach, or you feel that you just must have a new car, is the Avora 400 really going to satisfy you? And more to the point, how does an old Esprit fare compared to someone who's used to the brand new 400? Because they are both made by the same company, but they share fairly different approaches to car making. The Esprit, this one, although it's only 12 years old, is based on a platform that was designed in the 1970s and changed fairly little from its original design. Now the V8 is a last in the line of Esprits. The Esprit started off as the Series 1 160 horsepower car, best known to people as the submarine in a James Bond movie. It then became the Turbo in the very early 80s, and then it became restyled by Peter Stevens of McLaren F1 fame in the late 80s, was restyled again by Julian Thompson of Elise fame in the mid 90s, and then it finally in 1996 got this V8 engine. Now Lotus had always wanted to build the car with a V8 and in fact there was a separate model code for a V8 powered Esprit on the original Esprit designs drawn up in the 70s. Unfortunately it took 20 years for it to actually get the power plant it was always meant to have. Unfortunately, as was the case with Lotus, the new engine was more a case of need rather than want. They knew that the old turbo unit wasn't going to be able to last much longer in the face of new emissions restrictions, and they basically had to find an engine that would fit in the Esprit chassis because it's not a big space and they couldn't afford to completely redesign the car. So they decided to design an engine from the ground up. Quite who thought it was going to be cheaper to build an engine than to build a new chassis, I don't know. The real shame is that the engine they built was absolutely fantastic. It's a 3.5 litre, 90 degree, flat plane crank V8 with two turbochargers and was easily capable of 500 horsepower. Sadly, the Renault UN1 gearbox out of the 25 definitely wasn't capable of handling 500 horsepower. Now, the guys at Renault apparently were very, very kind to the uh, Lotus guys and let them keep buying the transmission that Renault themselves had stopped using forever ago. Lotus were forced to keep using this transmission because it was the only one that would actually fit in the space that they had. And although it actually works alright, it's certainly not a slick affair. Uh, I can see how it perhaps got a little bit of criticism compared to the Ferrari or Porsche shifters at the time. But it's not as bad as I thought it might be. It definitely works. This car only has 6,500 miles on it, so it is an excellent example of what uh, the Esprit V8 should be. An awful lot of them have been modified and changed. The one thing that you're not going to get with this car is a really nice V8 whale like you did with the contemporary Ferrari 355. It's a combination of things, basically having turbochargers on an engine is always going to strangle it a little bit. And of course you had a, a very tight emissions restrictions and noise restrictions to pass. And Lotus didn't have the money that Ferrari did to invent some clever valve trickery. Unless I knew, I'd never guess this car had a V8 engine in it. It's a pleasant car to drive. Like the new Lotuses, we're driving on very, very poor roads, but it's handling them really, really well. It feels great to be in. I feel so low slung. Compared to the Evora, I feel like I'm really cosseted and I feel like I'm sat in the bathtub, I think is the cliche, and it pretty much rings true. You've got a very high transmission tunnel next to you, you've got a fairly high window line here, and it's just a really, really enjoyable place to be. I'm not going to stress the car at all, A, because it's not mine, B, because I couldn't afford to replace it if I did break it, and C, I don't know the roads. So one thing for the engine is it definitely doesn't feel turbocharged. I get an occasional from the wastegate, but actually I'm feeling no surge of power or torque. It's very, very linear, very, very easy, very, very predictable. That's no doubt because the turbos aren't probably helping the engine along too much. 
Lotus tuned it down to about 350 horsepower and it kept that figure from the very first V8 to the very last. It's a really nice car. It's really, really nice. The suspension in the Esprit is quite different to in the Evora. At low speed, the Evora suspension is relatively firm but becomes quite pliant as you really pile on the speed. With the Esprit, it is pretty soft and plush even at low speeds. Now that does present some problems as I found out on the short test drive. I've given its owner a couple of wincing moments because the car will scrape along the ground even on relatively minor crests and bumps so it's something to watch out for and bear in mind as well this car is totally standard in terms of ride height and body work. There's nothing altered about it so this is how they always were. If you're going to use one of these as a daily driver I think you may have some difficulty particularly if you live somewhere with a lot of aggressive speed bumps and definitely don't go into an era of multi-story car park you'd have a very very bad day indeed. I feel like someone's hidden the gear lever on a, on a high shelf. <laughs> the brakes in this do feel quite heavily assisted. It doesn't, does it have power steering? It does, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Steering's nice, feedback is good. It is a Lotus after all. It is a lot lower to the ground than my Evora. Uh, I've had a couple of little scrapes in it already, uh, which I wouldn't have expected. It is interesting when you look at the side profiles, you can see that there is clearly a lot more suspension travel for the Esprit, whereas the Evora appears to have hidden all of its suspension travel somewhere or other. In any case, this car feels like a really, really special place to be. And it's just a, an event. While we were rigging the cameras in this car, we had two separate families come to us in a pub car park and ask for their kids to uh, to have pictures taken in them. So far, it's a one-all on the five-year-old boy uh, vote. Uh, it's one for the Esprit and one for the Evora. So, yeah, it's neck and neck there. They both got a peel. The Evora did win it on colour, so if the Esprit was yellow as well, who's to say? Uh, it's got a bigger wing, so, you know, there's that to go for it. A big wing counts very, very highly in small boy stakes. That have more exhausts so you know that's important this car I don't know whether it is wider than the Evora but it feels a mile wide <laughs> it, there's only millimeters between them in reality but in proportions terms the Esprit is really genuine old-school supercar lines yeah. despite the fact that it's come from a design that is basically 40 years old at the time of manufacture, yeah. it still holds up really, really well. It's still a striking car. It sits so nicely and so well. And this car is very, very original, so you get an appreciation for what it would have looked like. It's not been tinkered about. Most of them do get modified exhausts, and they do sound a bit noisier. They, they never will, and they just can't sound like a flat plane crank Ferrari. Here's the thing that I don't understand. Now, I got in this car, okay, it's a 2003 car. I look down here and you see what is, uh, I don't think anyone's gonna try and defend it, relatively cheap switch gear in a strange place. But, if I get in a Ferrari from the same era as this, if I get in a 360 or even a 430, you're going to find pretty cheap looking switch gear in strange places that looks like it was put there by somebody that put no thought into it whatsoever and you know that they spent infinitely longer wondering about the width of the stripe on the bonnet than they did about where they put the switch gear in the middle and the strange thing is that when it's Ferrari nobody seems to care they seem to forgive them and go ah well it's because it's Italian who cares you know but when it's British, if you happen to have the door handle from a Morris Marina or something like that, then you get slated for it and people sort of get quite derisory. And it's really, really unfair because, in actual fact, if a door handle works, a door handle works. It's a ruddy door handle. If a switch works, a switch works. You know, Lotus shouldn't be spending money on frivolous things because if they did, these cars would have cost twice as much money as they did. Now when this car came out, it was the best part of £70,000, sort of between 60 and 70 depending on how you spec them. Now a base 911 at the time was about the same money. A Ferrari 355 at the time was nearer to £100,000. And guess what? It was the Ferrari that the Esprit got compared with. So you're looking at a car that cost about 50% more. Uh, don't worry about that. 
sorry about giving us any room. <laughs> so, the Esprit of the time was a genuine supercar. Its performance was equal with that of the Junior Ferrari. And that's not something that you can say of the Evora 400. Its performance is more contemporary with a current 911. Now, the truth is that what's happened is that the Junior mid-engine supercar Ferrari has gone up in price so much that it's just entertaining a completely different crowd. It's working at an absolutely different level to its own forebears. So the question you kind of have to ask yourself is if the Esprit V8 offered you Ferrari thrills, Ferrari drama and Ferrari, in their case, pace, but for Porsche money, that's the kind of yardstick which I think the Evora should be judged against. And I have to say, with my experience of it, I'd say the 400 in that case is a very worthy successor because it is a car which definitely gets the looks, stares and attention you'd expect any sort of Italian exotic. They do frequently get mistaken for Ferraris and Lamborghinis and I take that as a compliment every time that it happens. But they're doing so at a price point which is now, arguably, much more competitive than the 911s. So in that case, I'd say the Evora 400 is a very, very worthy successor to the V8. So in summary, today's been a great day. First ever driving an Esprit, and what an Esprit it is. It's very, very interesting. It's totally not what I expected, but frankly, I didn't know what to expect. I am, as mentioned earlier, incredibly grateful to its owner for uh, loaning it to me, particularly given its box fresh state, as I am told this car has a shiny trophy sat at home for a concourse win in the recent Lotus Festival. And I basically can't wait to drive another one. I hope I get the opportunity again. And I really, really look forward to seeing a new Esprit from Lotus. I think they genuinely can compete with McLaren and Ferrari, just like they used to. But in the meantime, if you want your fix and you've got to have a new car, and you always hang it after an Esprit, you will not be disappointed with an Evora. Bye-bye. Does the wheel adjust? I imagine it doesn't. Uh, I forget. It is rumoured, or no, it's not rumoured, it's fact, 